I'm taking a look at another of my favourite games by Gary Kasparov. This one is against Anatoly Karpov from their World Championship match in 1990. And it's the 20th game. They have five games still to play in this match. The score was 10-9 in Kasparov's favour, but with five games to go, of course, anything could still happen. We join the game after 12 moves. It's so-called Zaitsev variation of the Rai Lopez, Karpov playing black. And the Zaitsev variation is where the bishop comes to b7 in this closed position, pressurizing e4. The rook also puts pressure on the e4 pawn. And one of White's problems here is that he would like to move this knight away perhaps maneuver it around g3, and that would free the bishop and put the knight on a nice square. The problem is the e4 pawn is under fire, so if knight f1, then pawn takes pawn, and you can see there's too much pressure on this pawn here. So let's just go back. So for that reason, let me just clear some colour off the board. Kasparov played bishop c2. Well, it's one of the main lines in this position. And the idea is that possibly in some positions you can now swing the knight round to g3 because e4 gets additional protection. You have to still be careful about that. But another idea is that perhaps you make room for the b-pawn, perhaps to come to b3, and then in that way to develop the bishop because at the moment it's blocked by the knight on d2. And maybe the bishop comes around sometimes even to d3 to pressure the pawn on b5. So it's a multi-purpose move. It's also, I should say, in the long term, perhaps pointing in the direction of these slightly weakened light squares, as we will see. Now here, it's, it's one of those fundamental Spanish decisions. Do you maintain the tension in the centre of the board and leave your pawn on e5, or do you capture on d4? Well, you could, for example, play solidly with queen d7, connecting the rooks, or perhaps rook b8. Both these moves have been played. They're both reasonable. But Karpov selects a really sharp continuation, very double-edged, exchanging in the middle of the board. So giving white this strong central pawn position, but why has he done this? Well, first of all, it gives his knight a nice square on b4. Of course, Kasparov wants to retain this light squared bishop, so the bishop comes back here. And now we can see why Karpov has done this. He wants a double-edged position. He wants to play for a win in the match situation. This was very important. So black has this potentially dangerous queenside pawn majority rolling down the board and still pressurizing white's central position but yeah in return white has this central pawn majority kasparov takes the pressure off the e4 pawn and blocks out the bishop and now the knight swings round and now the rook comes to a3 so there's potential for this rook at some point to swing across to the king side. Now in their 1986 World Championship match they discussed this move, pawn to c4, on quite a few occasions. And the idea is that the knight swings round to c5 and then perhaps into uh, d3. Now the problem is that this can leave the d4 square open. It's really double-edged. Uh, but in this 1990 match, Karpov played another double-edged move, f5, which compromises his king position but undermines the support for the pawn on d5. Really double-edged. Um, now, in game four, Kasparov had taken the pawn on f5. But for this game, he played rook to e3, and this had been played... Um, by Timon against Karpov in in their candidates match earlier in the year. Now Karpov there 
had played the pawn to f4, and the rook had gone back to e2, and this was probably good for black. But Kasparov said that he'd prepared this very deeply and had prepared this move rook a3, and he thinks this is good for white. Now, instead, Karpov, I imagine, was anticipating this, and he played the knight to f6, just increasing the pressure on this pawn duo in the centre. So there's, there's real tension here. Kasparov dropped the knight back to h2, and this was also a new move of the time. Why knight h2? Well, it sometimes prepares the path for, path for the queen to come to the, the, the king side, that's one thing, and maybe sometimes the rook can come over to g3, and sometimes, much later on, the knight can join in the attack. Now, Karpov played here king to h8, but this was met by this very tricky move, b3. And Kasparov wrote afterwards, he said he felt that this was psychologically very unpleasant for Karpov because he's just moved his king into the corner and now it's going to be met by this bishop firing straight at it along the long diagonal. And, well, Karpov exchanged. And now there's a fundamental decision. Should he take this pawn in the middle of the board and take a pawn in the centre? Now, I can understand why Karpov didn't want to do this. I mean, this would be a very typical situation. So black is a pawn up here. But look what happens. This bishop has this wonderful diagonal towards the king. There's also a threat to take here and take on d5. And apart from that simple threat, there's also this idea to bring the bishop to the long diagonal. I'm not surprised that Karpov declined to go into this and instead played c4. Now, one of the ideas of this move is to try to block out this bishop on b1 with knight d3. Anyway, bishop b2 came. Good idea. Bishop on the long diagonal. And now Karpov chose to take on e4. If he blocks out here, then white just takes this pawn and probably will pick up the pawn on d3. Should be good for white. OK, Karpov took on e4, took on d5, and the battle is really reaching a crisis point with, look at white's bishops. These bishops pointing towards the king. The rook has swung over as well. The queen is ready to join the attack. How you withstand this? Well, Karpov might be able to. He first of all played rook e6 to defend some pawn, the pawn along the sixth rank. Now, knight g4. Later, Kasparov said that he thought knight f3 might be even stronger, but okay, knight g4 is quite strong enough. And here, probably, black should try to block things out with knight d3. And now Kasparov analyzed this in, in enormous detail and, and thinks it, it, it might well lead to a draw. But Well, maybe, but I think in practical terms, this is such a difficult position for black to defend. Instead, Karpov played queen e8, which looks like a very interesting option because now this knight on e4 is pinned. So it looks as though White's attack is really being slowed in this position. And now knight takes h6. And Kasparov said, after, uh, after the game, he said, for some reason I had not a shadow of doubt about the correctness of White's attacking construction. He totally believed in his sacrifice, and he played this actually very, very quickly. So, okay, let's first of all, we should say that this pawn is pinned, can't be taken. So, what about rook takes h6? Well, now there's knight takes d6, so a discovered attack, and this is fatal. If rook takes, well, we take the queen, and queen h5 check wins more material. So let's go back. So Karpov tried c3, 
blocking out this bishop, and this is still really sharp. Still, perhaps not easy to foresee that this this would lead to mate. But let's see what happens. So, Kasparov simply brought the knight back here. I mean, this is a very cool follow-up, just giving up that bishop on b2, but now preparing the way for the queen. So it's it's a kind of slow motion attack, but Kasparov simply believed that with this incredible mass of pieces on the king side, backed up by that bishop and the rook, that he should break through, and his judgment was absolutely correct. Karpov played bishop c8, hoping perhaps to be able to exchange off a piece. Well, now, if knight takes g7, then rook e4 is a good move, so you can see the point of bishop c8. But instead came queen h4 check. Now, the rook came in the way. If instead king g8, then this is a powerful move. So making sure that when this knight moves, that the rook won't be check taken with check. And now simple threat of knight g5, followed by queen h7 mate. Looks like it wins. But OK, queen h4 check, rook h6 was played. And now knight takes and pawn takes. So what's the material balance? Well, it's a rook against two minor pieces. Watch out for the pawn. White still has to make the final break. If knight f6, that's the discovered attack we want to make, then the rook is taken with check, and now this is a saving move. Pinning the rook so there's no rook g8, and threatening the knight on f6. Black wins. But Kasparov had prepared a beautiful, beautiful attacking idea. He played his king h2, and this is an echo of game 16 of the 1986 World Championship match, where... Kasparov had also played this beautiful idea, king h2, in a Spanish. And it was also on move 31. Perhaps I'll, I'll look at that game on another occasion. Now, the idea is that when the knight moves, this rook won't be taken with check. So, for example, if rook a7, well, it seems reasonable to d defend along the seventh rank, then knight f6 is a winning move. Uh, threatening rook g8 mate. And if queen f7, well, watch how white's pieces are drawn towards black's king, as though as though the black's king is a magnet. If knight takes, then this is a winning move. And now we can sort of a pseudo-sacrifice of the queen. And now you can choose how you want to take, but I think that's uh, the most pleasing to my eye at any rate, and checkmate. So, Karpov played queen e5, hoping to survive by pinning. But now knight g5, so threatening knight f7 and checkmate. Queen came back, and now again, white pieces flood into the position. Threatening, again, knight f7, check. Bishop came out, and a beautiful move, queen h6. And knight f7 check, that forces king h7. Only move to stop mate is queen g6. And here Kasparov said that he still regrets that he didn't play rook takes g6. And this is going to lead to mate after this. And now rook g4 is checkmate. Instead, well, he was short of time and he played bishop takes. He'd seen that this was winning very simply. Now he took the rook on a8. Now, although one might think this pawn is, is dangerous, in fact, this is well covered by the bishop. And now Kasparov just cleaned up with this check. And here Karpov resigned. If knight takes, then rook takes pawn. White is two exchanges up and has still has these pawns. Well, with that victory... Kasparov went to a lead of two points, 11 to 9, and duly got to the winning line and, and won, retained his world title. 
but it was a very close match. I, I think I'll go back and look at some of those other games another time, but this is one of my favourite Kasparov victories.